All right, everyone, it's two o'clock. We've got a few people coming in from the waiting room, but we're going to go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Great to see so many of you. I know we've had a couple weeks um, in between our last session and today, so hope you all have been doing well. And it's great to see so many um, returning attendees on today's Zoom. So thanks for, for being here with us. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items before we get started. A reminder that our next webinar will be next week. So we don't have a break uh, in between this webinar and our next one. So next Thursday, November 17th at 2 p.m., we are going to ha uh, have Dr. Bree Betcher uh, from the CU Anschutz Alzheimer's and Cognition Center talk to us about risk factors and prevention for healthy brains. So it'll be a good conversation next week. We then will take a break for the Thanksgiving holiday um, and uh, come back after the holiday uh, for December 8th, our final webinar, which will include um, brain health equity in the Hispanic and Latinx community. So a couple great topics uh, in addition to today to wrap up the fall 2022 webinar series. Um, you will be receiving the follow-up email. Just a reminder, many of you have been great about filling out the evaluation link that is in that email. Please just take 30 seconds. It's a very quick couple question uh, evaluation that really um, getting your feedback about um, the topics, the presentations, what you'd like to hear in the future are hugely helpful as we schedule out these webinars um, each semester. So do uh, take a minute or two to fill that out for us. We really do appreciate it. Um, in addition, uh, in that email will be the link for the YouTube channel, which you can go back and look at any of the archived webinar series um, presentation, just in case you have missed any. So uh, make sure to bookmark that link as well. Um, I'd like to do a big thank you, obviously, for our co-hosts today, uh, Denver Public Library, uh, the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs Aging Center, as well as the CU Anschutz Alzheimer's and Cognition Center. They have been my co-hosts this fall semester's webinar series, and it's been terrific uh, working with them. Um, and hopefully, we can team up and do uh, more community education in 2023. So uh, with that, um, let's just make sure that you're muted. So you might just want to double check because you might have some fun things going on in the background and we don't want to distract from today's presentation. Uh, please don't forget to put your questions in the chat as Dr. Cosmo is presenting. You do not have to wait till the end. We'll collect those and then after his presentation today, we'll open it up for Q&A and I'll help um, with that dialogue. So please, as you think a question, put it in there right away so that you don't forget to ask um, after the presentation is over. So with that, I would like to hand this off to Dr. Michael Corsmo, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology here at the University of Colorado's Anschutz Medical Campus. He is a board certified neurologist with fellowship training in movement disorders. So with that, Dr. Corsmo, it is all yours. Thanks so much for the wonderful introduction. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining me. Um, many of you might not know what movement disorders really covers. And uh, we see essentially uh, a lot of things that cause walking problems, like Parkinson's, tremor syndromes, et cetera. Um, and so these diseases we classify as neurodegenerative diseases, uh, not unlike different dementing processes. And so certainly I see kind of all of that stuff. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about a, a really light topic, uh, the global, national, and rural burden of neurodegenerative disease. Um, and I've kind of always had an interest in uh, th these bigger picture issues um, since I did my residency training. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, create and launch um, our global neurology rotation. And so I've uh, gotten to spend several months abroad um, in Malawi, in Africa, doing this type of work. Um, so always have had an interest and in, interested in uh, expanding people's understanding of these issues. And so today's talk is going to be uh, global, 
Um, and it's going to be sort of a state of the union talk about neurologic care, um, what the future holds, how are we gonna access this care? And so we're gonna start off uh, very globally uh, by talking about the current burden of, of neurologic disease uh, across the planet. Uh, then we're going to talk about sort of the future. What does the future hold in terms of supply versus demand economics for neurologic care? Um, we're going to zoom in further on the United States and talk about how we access care here um, and what issues there may be. We're then going to zoom in further on a unique population in rural America um, to see what issues uh, these different populations face. Um, and then lastly, I'm just going to briefly talk about a couple of ways that I and our group um, at the university uh, from the movement disorders perspective um, are working to chip away at some of those issues. And so let's dive in and talk about the burden of neurologic diseases globally. Um, and we understand this burden by looking at a, a big study that's ongoing called the Global Burden uh, of Disease Study and last published in 2016, although you technically get annual updates about um, different diseases across about 195 countries and how they contribute to mortality, morbidity, et cetera. And what we learned in 2016 were that, was that neurologic diseases across the board, not just neurodegenerative diseases, uh, they were the number two leading cause of death. Um, but I think a lot of people might be more surprised to learn that neurologic diseases were actually the number one cause of disability adjusted life years. And this is an important concept, a, a disability adjusted life year. Uh, and what that is, is it's really the combination of years of life lost prematurely, so death, but also years of life lost to, to disability. Uh, because more than just causing death, uh, neurologic and specifically neurodegenerative diseases are disabling. And that can significantly impact um, a population, a country, a family, um, in terms of economics, the money we spend uh, to, to treat those diseases. Um, the uh, revenue lost, uh, the person can't work anymore, and even potentially revenue of other family members or members of the uh, group who need to chip in to help out. So in many ways, disability is much more burdensome on, on uh, societies, and so that's something uh, to be taken into account. So that's now, but what does the future hold? And so this map uh, is showing us in blue the countries where greater than 20% of your population are above age 65. And this was actually way back in 2006. So it's kind of showing you the, the number of countries with a more of an aging population. And so how is that expected to change into the future? Uh, by 2050, um, there's a lot more blue, a lot more countries where again, greater than 20% of your population is above 65. And so why are we looking at this? Well, this is essentially a proxy for the wave of neurodegenerative diseases coming our way. Another way to look at this on the far left uh, would be to look at population dynamics with age and how they're changing across time. So we're, we're in a really interesting place in human history right now. For the bulk of human history, uh, population graphed against age here and this is kind of numbers here on the x-axis, has sort of been in this pyramid shape where you've got a lot of young people and not very many people living very long. And that's kind of gradually changing and it's, uh, it's uh, projected to change drastically by 2015 where fertility rates are dropping um, and due to modern medicine, uh, people are living a lot longer. Uh, and that's great, but what it means is a lot more neurodegenerative disease coming our way to address. So zooming in on uh, the United States, how are we meeting that current burden right now? And we can take a look at that by looking at access to care. How are people accessing care? Um, so on average, across the United States in 2012, there were about 5.2 neurologists per 100,000 people. Um, so that's just a number. What does that mean? Uh, before I put that into context, know that certainly those rates vary significantly depending on where you are and where you live in the United States. 
Um, but if we look at family medicine doctors in Utah, there's about 99 family med doctors per 100,000, or these would be primary care doctors. And in a more populated place like DC, you've got about 460 family medicine doctors per 100,000. And absolutely, certainly there should be more primary care doctors than subspecialists. Um, but it's kind of shocking to see how few of us there are given how common neurologic symptoms, diseases are. Um, this map is kind of interesting. So it's giving you the breakdown of where the neurologists are. And so the numbers you see reported here are number of neurologists per 100,000 people. Um, and a lot of this kind of makes sense. So if you're in more densely populated areas, like maybe on the East Coast, um, there's a lot more neurologists, maybe upwards of six, seven per 100,000. Um, and in more sort of rural states, uh, more sparsely populated states, that number falls off significantly like in Idaho. Um, well, so that's the number of neurologists. So are there shortages reflected in other ways? Like how do we know that those supply versus demand economics are actually off at all? Um, well, we know there are shortages and they're reflected in a variety of ways. Uh, first of which is wait times, which many of you might have some experience with that. Um, in 2012, the average wait time to see even just a general neurologist uh, was about 35 business days. And um, I'm sort of a sub-sub specialist, so I'm a neurologist who specializes in movement disorders. And I can tell you our wait times are three, six times that frequently. Um, how about cardiology at the same time? It was about half that in terms of wait time. Are they reflected in other places, these shortages? And they seem to be uh, reflected in visit times. So back in 2004, the number of hours that the average neurologist would spend on direct patient care uh, was about 42.4 hours in a week. Um, and certainly neurologists do a lot more than just directly see patients. They've got to write their notes, order tests, interpret the tests, manage inbox with your questions and follow up. Um, a lot of them in academic centers are doing things like research and outreach and lectures like this. Um, in 2004, the number of office visits dedicated uh, to neurologic care in a given week at a particular facility or clinic was about 72.7. And so moving forward in time to 2010, the number of hours that a neurologist was spending on patient care was about the same, 42.3 hours per week. But what you'll see is the number of office visits is rising. And so what that means is less time and more patience, um, giving you a hint that uh, demand is outpacing supply. And that's back in 2010. It's now a decade later. Um, so that's now. Um, how are these sort of supply versus demand economics projected to change into the future? Um, and this group, Timothy M. Dahl uh, et al., um, look to forecast this um, and using a, sort of a complicated set of equations and uh, prediction models, um, they uh, forecast supply and demand through 2025 nationally and by state. So 2025, not too far away from us. And so they would forecast supply, so the pool of neurologists who are seeing patients um, by sort of modeling how many new people are coming in and how many people are sort of aging out or retiring out of the pool. And then more complicated was essentially taking a population and looking at all the different factors that contribute to risk for developing a neurologic disease. Um, and they modeled that into the future. And we get this. So there's two maps here. And if you focus your attention over here on the left side, um, that's supply versus demand in 2012. So that was at the time they were working on this problem. And so states shaded in blue are the states where you've got supply exceeding demand. You've got plenty of neurologists. Um, states in green are sort of neutral, supplies equaling demand. And then pretty much most of the United States is shaded in some form of red, which is where demand or the, the amount of neurologic care needed um, is not being met by the number of neurologists available. 
And the, the projection into the future into 2025 is on the right. And what you can see is the, the problem is not getting better. Uh, it's getting worse. So are we going to be able to meet that demand? I'm not so sure. I'm concerned. And a lot of you might be surprised to also know that only 2.6% of U.S. medical students go into neurology. That's tiny given the, the number of patients that we're trying to care for. Why is that happening? What's going on? Um, I think a lot of us in the field really aren't particularly financially motivated, but I think to ignore the connection between the subspecialties that make money and how uh, many people go into those would be kind of foolish. And so there has been shown this strong and direct correlation between higher salaries and higher fill rates of certain specialties. And that's because there's a big difference in pay depending on what what specialty you go into. And we're not going to go into all those reasons, but the way that we bill for services um, varies a lot depending on whether or not you're doing a procedure. So if you do things to people, uh, if you provide procedures like surgeries, or you interpret tests for them like a radiologist, or you're zapping warts off people's faces, um, you've got a much higher salary and there's a lot more competition for those spots. More cognitive specialties, specialties like neurology and primary care, where we sit and talk with you and do an exam and try to help, those are the lowest salaries and the lowest fill rates. So that's a part of it, unfortunately. I think a bigger part of it is this concept of neurophobia, which you might not have heard of. Um, and neurophobia really kind of encompasses a couple of different things. One, even within the medical field, um, there is this sense of futility with regard to what we do. Um, I can't tell you how many of my colleagues in other specialties will say things like, Mike, I can't believe uh, you do what you do. I couldn't uh, treat all those patients with Parkinson's. It's so sad. There's nothing you can do. And that's just false. It's just patently false. There's a lot of things we can do for people uh, to help give them a much better quality of life. Uh, and the field is moving rapidly with regard to new treatments and new things around the corner, depending on what diseases we're talking about. Um, neurophobia also comes from um, how we teach medical students about neurology, um, because neurology, learning about neurology is kind of scary. It's felt to be very complex. You've got to learn neuroanatomy and memorize it, and you've got to think about how different medications chemically um, work in the nervous system, and so on and so forth. Um, the neurologic exam we, we do, the checking reflexes, strength, all this stuff, um, it's very time intensive and it's a skill set that's very unique. And so that scares a lot of people off. Um, but what I can tell you is that neurologists aren't um, any you know, smarter or more able to perform the neurologic exam than any other subspecialty. Um, it's just something you choose to work on. And another part of neurophobia comes from outside neurology. And, and it's really reinforced by a lack of training aimed at non-neurologists. So it's really shocking to think about how often a neurologic complaint is seen in a primary care office and how minimal uh, their training is to deal with those problems. So that's kind of the United States, but let's zoom in further on a more rural population uh, and a very unique population with unique considerations. And that's the Navajo Nation. Um, if you're not familiar, um, this is home to the largest American Indian tribe in the United States. Um, it's a giant land mass. It crosses uh, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. And it's home to about 200,000 people on about 25,000 square miles. And so to kind of put that into perspective, the population of Providence, Rhode Island, which is a biggish city, is about the same size. So a lot of people, really big land mass. So how do they get care? Um, many of them get care through what's called the Indian Health Service or IHS. Um, and if you're not familiar, uh, this is an agency within the Department of Health and Human Services. So it's run and funded by us and our government. 
and it provides care to about 2.5 million of our nation's 5 million American Indian and Native Alaskan population. And this relationship goes back way, way back to uh, treaties, case law, and even the Constitution. So it's a promise uh, that we've made. So um, how do they access neurologic care? <clears throat> and it's really difficult to sort of estimate a number here, put a number on how many neurologists they have access to, because it's pretty rare that neurologists are directly employed by IHS. Rather, there will be neurologists traveling in from outside occasionally for sort of traveling clinics, um, and some patients are able to be referred out elsewhere. Um, but generally speaking, at a given time in that Navajo Nation, there's one, maybe two neurologists employed. And so the national average, again, is about uh, five neurologists per 100,000 people, and they have about 0.5 neurologists per 100,000 people. Um, shocking. What about like a bigger medical center, a hospital? Maybe that's how people access neurologic care. And we can look at this. So the Gallup Indian Medical Center is the biggest and the busiest IHS hospital in the United States. Um, they've got 99 beds, so it's not huge, um, but they see a lot of patients annually of roughly 6,000. And they have no neurologists. So if you have a stroke there, you're not going to be seen by a neurologist. If you've got a seizure or an infection in your brain, you're not going to be seen by a neurologist. Nor do they even have access to sort of neurologic tests, which we consider pretty basic, like EEG, that's a brainwave test, or EMG, these are like nerve conduction studies, nerve tests. Let's put that into uh, perspective. So the UC Health Hospital, the big one out at Anschutz in Aurora, um, they've got a lot more beds, 700 beds, but the neurology service alone, so the group of neurologists and neurology residents who work there, um, they alone see about 2,000 patients annually. That's a ton. And so if we sort of adjust for bed size at Gallup, we would expect them to be seeing at least 300 consults um, uh, for neurologic problems annually. And again, they get zero. So why the inequity? Um, I think we can uh, guess a lot of the reasons, but one of the reasons is they don't have providers. So what are the barriers to retaining providers? Um, part of this is probably due to a, a frustration in barriers to a certain level of care. A lot of us, for better or worse, are trained in the highest um, resource settings. So when I trained, um, I have access to MRI right now. I have access to all the best medications, etc. cetera. Um, you've also got to think about what employment opportunities in these rural places um, are there for spouses or partners of providers. Um, what kind of activities or educational opportunities are there for their children? Um, and certainly there's the financial incentives um, versus really big debt that we're starting to accrue more of uh, to train. And those financial incentives aren't there anymore. Um, there used to be interesting debt forgiveness programs for sort of doing time with the Indian Health Service. And they still will uh, chip away at some of your debt, but it's a very small fraction. So it's really not... Uh, informing a lot of people's decision-making there. How about on the patient end of things? Um, there are huge barriers to travel. So uh, American Indian, Indian and Alaskan natives living in more remote parts of the country are gonna travel 400 miles or more sometimes just to access basic healthcare services, not neurology. Also about 40% of that population in the Navajo Nation was technically living in poverty in 2019. And so certainly that affects things like car ownership, maintenance, gas, and it would make you think twice about taking time away from your job or other duties to go see a neurologist somewhere else. How about funding, uh, the money side of things, what barriers are there? Um, and the big problem here is IHS, like a lot of other programs, is competing with other spending programs, like the big Department of Defense. Putting things into perspective, in the United States in 2016, um, we spent about, per capita, 
uh, $374 to improve our infrastructure. So better clinics, uh, better testing facilities, et cetera. IHS was allocated 35 bucks per capita to improve their infrastructure. What about more personal health expenditures uh, per capita? Well, in the United States in 2016, it was about 10,000 per capita on healthcare expenditures. IHS was a fraction of that, uh, three, uh, about $4,000. And then lastly, while yes, you can technically refer these patients to outside facilities, you could send them to me. Um, they have those barriers to travel, but they're also gonna be typically paying out of pocket unless they have supplemental insurance. So just a lot of barriers. And um, this is painting a pretty stark and kind of depressing picture, to be honest. Um, but um, we're trying to work on it. And we're all trying to do our bit to chip away at this problem. And I'm gonna talk to you briefly about two ways that I'm working uh, on the problem. So if we are only gonna put 2% of all medical students into neurology, and we're also not showing that net numbers increasing, we better figure out how to better educate our primary care colleagues and how to deal with some of this stuff. Um, and that's something that I've become very interested in. And so through grant funding and in cooperation with a group called Project ECHO, um, we've been able to launch an online education program where we essentially teach primary care providers uh, simple, practical, meaningful tips for treating some of the stuff that we see and some of the stuff that we don't necessarily need to see. Um, so we offer uh, an educational series called Identifying and Treating Tremor and Parkinson's Disease. Um, so ECHO is a really interesting group. They're dedicated to offering these sort of um, tele-educational programs um, across the country, and they're kind of segregated out by state. Um, what's really unique is these are very interactive and sort of case-based sessions. Um, and we, through doing about three rounds of our program, have reached about 40 to 50 providers uh, across state lines, across multiple states. And so it's going really well, and we're going to keep building on it and hopefully keep this program going. Additionally, if we're going to sort of concentrate our neurologists um, in these more densely populated areas and cities, um, we better figure out how to potentially expand our reach. And so one thing that came from the uh, COVID pandemic was doctors taking telehealth more seriously. Now, it's a tricky one in neurology because we rely so heavily on our exam on seeing feeling, touching, to sort of come up with a diagnosis. Um, but we're also thinking about creative ways to make diagnoses and treat patients through telehealth. And so we've also received grant funding uh, through Medicaid uh, for something like this. And so Medicaid offers uh, money through their upper payment limit program. And this is basically a bucket of money that Medicaid is willing to give out to people interested in expanding care to subspecialty services. Um, and so we're doing this already. We're seeing patients now uh, remotely for movement disorders. Um, and we're seeing patients in rural or sort of frontier areas of Colorado right now, and really hoping to expand that with time. So those are just two small pieces. Certainly there's way bigger fish to fry here further upstream. Can we alter billing practices so we interest people financially more in neurology? Can we inspire more younger people uh, to take on this challenging career? Because we need them, um, because we're not going to be able to stop the sort of wave of uh, neurodegenerative disease that's coming our way. And we're already not meeting that demand. So sort of in summary, these are a couple of takeaways from today. Um, I want you to know that uh, neurologic diseases are the number one cause of disability globally. Um, neurodegenerative diseases are becoming more prevalent because we've got an aging population here and everywhere. Um, right now, we're not meeting demand, and that's projected to worsen into the future. Additionally, uh, our, our friends in rural and resource-limited settings fare far worse. 
And so we really need to inspire more people to consider careers in neurology. We need to think about how we're going to uh, provide care through different means, like maybe asking primary care providers to chip in more. So we've got to provide them with the tools to do that. And then lastly, we've got to think about really creative ways to sort of expand our reach. Um, and with that, um, I think I'll leave it there and I'll open it up to questions. And, and again, thanks so much for spending your afternoon with me. Thanks, Dr. Cosmo. That's terrific. And as you're presenting about the, the neurologist shortage, I'm thinking you know, of the world we live in in geriatrics, which is in the same position. Um, there's only 90, uh, 96 geriatricians in the entire state of Colorado. So you can imagine with the growing population of older Coloradans, um, there's no way that just 96 geriatricians can treat um, all older Coloradans. So um, one of the ways that we're, we're chipping away, much like Dr. Cosmo and team are trying to do, um, is uh, the advocacy, certainly at the Capitol. So wearing our, our advocacy hat a little bit. And we did get in 2021, a bill passed uh, for a loan forgiveness program for specifically geriatric trained clinicians. And um, that would be a little bit of an incentive certainly for them to um, hopefully go into the field and then be able to um, uh, chip away at some of their student loan debt. This, uh, this 2023 legislative um, session, we have a bill that's going forward to um, improve healthcare access for older Coloradans where we're specifically targeting geriatric trained clinicians and creating a training pipeline. So this is across many different disciplines, which includes not only doctors, nurses, but also pharmacists, dentists, social workers, psychologists, speech therapists, physical therapists. So we're working very uh, closely on that bill right now. Um, it does have a sponsor at the Capitol. And for any of you that are interested in the advocacy piece, please, please reach out to me. Um, because we will be loud and proud down at the Capitol trying to get this passed. Because if we create a training pipeline that then feeds into a loan forgiveness incentive, then that's a nice kind of stream of training that hopefully mm. we can help incentivize um, more med students to go into uh, the field of geriatrics and then certainly, you know, neurology and other areas. So, so there is a, a ways to do this um, at the Capitol. Um, and we're, we're pretty, um, like I said, loud and proud down there trying to get this um, all passed for the, the next session. So we will keep you all posted on how that is going. Um, that's, uh, that's great work. And um, we, de we need more people doing that upstream work because I'm down in the trenches kind of doing the day-to-day -day work. Absolutely. But, um, and, and I think one thing I was hoping, you know, would come from a talk like this um, is raising awareness uh, mm -hmm. in our patients' understanding of this problem, or you folks. Uh, I think a lot of people aren't aware of this problem, and I think um, your advocacy could go a long way. It's your taxpayer dollars that train us mm -hmm. and that limit how many of us can train. And I think people don't know that's... right thing you could work on. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and when you're dissatisfied with really long wait times, if you're dissatisfied with short, brief visits with your providers, um, these are things that you could, you know, um, work toward raising awareness upstream on the hill. Um, right. Right. Yeah. I think the idea of just, you know, I need a doctor, I'm going to call one up and get in tomorrow. Um, it's becoming more and more difficult for some of the specialties, especially as we age mm -hmm. um, and we need a variety of, of specialists. So um, so a couple of things have come into the chat. Uh, please, everyone, make sure that you type your questions and or put your hand up um, in your Zoom box and we'll make sure to call in you and you can come off mute and ask Dr. Cosmo um, directly. But let's start a little bit with the chat. Um, David Thomas, if you're still on, you have um, you had made mention about a barrier um, that most 
doctors want several partners, three or more. Could you just clarify what you meant by that? Well, I mean, phys physician partners, not uh, uh, polygamy partners. And uh, yeah, one day it's hard to recruit uh, the first doctor, but or, and but the second doctor is a little easier, and the third doctor gets easier yet because you you need somebody, a colleague, to discuss difficult cases, and you. Uh, need somebody to take care of your patients when you take a day off or a week off or a vacation. Is David, did you have a question specifically or was that more of just? It's a comment. Comment, got it. Okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure that we don't miss a question in there, but thank you for sharing that. We appreciate it. Any thoughts, Dr. Corsmo, on that comment? Um, I mean, I agree. Uh, one of the things I love about being more of an academic physician, meaning I'm kind of university based, is I get to work with a team. Um, although my team isn't with me in the room, I'm constantly picking their brain behind the scenes. You're absolutely correct. When I take time off um, to raise a child, like I need to lean on other people to help uh, care for my patients. And that's not something a lot of rural, even PCPs have access to. Um, and so that that's an issue of numbers. We need more people. And we need to figure out ways to incentivize those people to go to potentially more rural places. Um, and I, I don't have the, the, the answer to that. <laughs> and that partly was the loan forgiveness was incentivizing some of our clinicians to go to uh, rural and underserved areas of Colorado to, mm -hmm. to become the, the resident specialist in that particular discipline. So we need more of that. Yeah. And I mean, like I IHS has done a similar program mm -hmm. in the past, which made a lot of sense for people back when your debt wasn't so high. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my colleagues and myself included um, we're in debt upwards of half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So even if you give us $20,000 toward our debt, that's nothing. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. The, the debt's too high for that to really incentivize people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And last I heard, I think the average med student, this is certainly average, not necessarily just the specialties, was about $300,000 in student debt once um, finishing uh, med school. And um, about seventy-five thousand for uh, nurse practitioners and PAs. So, just to give the audience a little bit of perspective of what our clinicians are facing uh, for their future. Uh, all right. So, John had a great question, Dr. Corsmo, about how do neuropsychologists um, fit into uh, this work? How do they in providing services? What exactly is their mm. role? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak for neuropsychologists. I can tell you my experience and how I work with them in movement disorders. Um, I tend to see a lot of dementing processes because they tend to co-occur with movement disorders frequently. And so sometimes um, what we'll do is we'll lean on them to perform what's called neuropsychological testing, which is this very in-depth uh, testing of cognition because... Um, I think a lot of people don't intuitively know that cognition is more than just memory. Mm -hmm. And different dementing processes can alter very select portions of cognition, not just memory. They can alter behavior. They can alter processing speed. They can alter your visual spatial abilities. Um, they can alter your language production uh, capabilities. And so taking the time to sort of segment out what parts of cognition are affected, what aren't, they can help give you maybe a more accurate diagnosis, whether or not that changes my management is questionable sometimes. Um, one thing that's really useful is it seems that neuropsychologists are um, very good at picking apart when mood disorders are sort of clouding the picture. Um, and so it's not infrequent for really bad cases of major depressive disorder to look like dementia. And um, it's really nice to pick up on that and know to go after that so you can kind of clear up cognition. And then the last way that I personally lean on them is for uh, a procedure we offer for Parkinson's disease, 
essential tremor, which is a tremor syndrome, and dystonia is deep brain stimulation. Um, you can think of that as like a pacemaker for your brain. It's a device. It's implanted. I program it. It's very cool. Um, but we do in-depth neuropsychological testing before a procedure like that. Uh, so we can be sure that we're not going to make someone's cognition worse. Um, but beyond that, it's a little outside my wheelhouse. But we, we do work with them closely in my clinic. Terrific. Thank you very much for that. Um, is uh, Project ECHO available for use by someone's personal PCP? And if yes. not, how would I suggest that training um, be in that particular area? Yeah, I mean, if, if there are, I mean, one thing you got to know is PCPs are so, 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 so busy. And so the, the people who sign up and are willing to give up their lunch hour um, while they're in clinic um, they are incredible people and very self-motivated people. Um, but you can always tell your, um, I think we, we could maybe share a link. Um, I think Nicole is here. Maybe she could throw that in the chat, um, the Echo webpage. Great. And I'll include it in the follow-up email as well. So Nicole, if you don't mind putting it in there, I'll make sure to catch it. Awesome. I Thanks. just put it up there. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. We, we want, we want to bring more people into the fold. So Tell your PCPs because tremors are a common symptom. And a big part of these community education webinars is for you all to take this information um, and be advocates and spread this uh, information certainly to your own primary care providers. So, um, so I hope you've learned a little bit about the ECHO program today. That's awesome. And we will include it in the follow-up email as well. Excellent. Um, Anne had mentioned that uh, they did not, through their health insurer, insure, which was Kaiser, um, have access to geriatricians. And um, Anne, you're exactly right. Like I said, unfortunately, there are just very few um, geriatric specialists here in um, the Colorado, state of Colorado, but really across the country. We're, we're no different. We actually do a better job um, than some other states. Um, through our division of geriatrics, we operate three seniors clinics across the Denver metro area, all staffed by our geriatrician team. So if you're interested in potentially um, being seen at one of those seniors clinics, I'll make sure to put that information in the follow-up email as well. Um, there is a criteria for being seen. You have to be over 75 and you have to be diagnosed with at least two comorbidities, but those senior clinics are available for at least the attendees on today's call that are uh, located in the Denver metro area. So um, happy to chat with you if you have additional questions about those clinics. But you're right, we need um, those clinics all over the state. So we probably need 10 times the number um, than what we currently have to see the very rapidly expanding population of older Coloradans. Um, so thank you. We've had some interest in the advocacy work. So uh, if you want to just put your email in there, I will capture that and make sure that you stay updated with our work around uh, advocacy and creating more of these training pipelines for our clinicians. Um, Dr. Corsmo, there is a question. Is there a similar lack of neurologists to perform research on new patients? Hmm. Um, I, I would guess there is. Um, I, I don't have like those numbers or a study to quote you. But, um, you know, something I'm, I'm interested in is, you know, inequity in care. And so there's kind of like three buckets <clears throat> you can fall into. You can have no care, you can have some care, and you can have the best care. And it's really important for us to have people who are pushing at the edges of the field, propelling us forward. Um, but what good is uh, a really fancy deep brain stimulation procedure when there's no neurologists in the Navajo Nation to make diagnoses, provide that. I mean, the amount of, uh, of, of benefit people can get from really simple interventions um, with, you know, doctors and, and providers who want to take the time and help uh, can be profound. 
And so, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm a clinically motivated person. I want the tide to rise for everybody. Um, so that's kind of where I stand. Yep, we need those people kind of pushing the boundaries, but we're leaving behind a lot of people on the way. And we need to think about how we can fix that problem. And along the same lines as research, um, older uh, adults are the um, most underrepresented population in research and clinical trials. And yet what often is coming out of that research and or clinical trial um, benefits uh, older adults and benefit all of us as we age. And so it is imperative to have more older adults participate in that research. And as a result of that, just this um, last six months here at CU Anschutz, we have created the Older Adult Research Specialist Training Program, which um, is a training for older adults to join research teams for paid positions. Um, and represent the older adult on those teams to go out and help educate, recruit, and retain older adults in more research. So we're trying to move the dial. So as much as we need researchers doing this work, we also need all of you um, to be participating in the research as well. So, um, so that's a very unique program. There, we haven't found another program like it across the United States. So to have it for our Coloradans on the call today, right here in our backyard is pretty special. So um, I can uh, include more information about that program uh, as well. So that's, all right. that's such a such a good point. I just also wanted to jump on that. Yeah, point. please. You know, we've been plagued by homogeneous populations in our studies, and our studies inform what we do. And we haven't classically done a great job in recruiting. Uh, more diverse populations, and um, that is absolutely critical. Absolutely, absolutely. And I know in neurology, um, they you all just recently hired one of our older adult research specialists to join your team. So, um, so that's we're we're making inroads, which is terrific. So. All right. Uh, another question for you, Dr. Corsmo, is would I be able to sign up for ECHO? I'm an independent, independent patient navigator. Um, you can. We offer it to everybody. We have pharmacists that join in. So you can. We are waiting on our sort of next round of, of uh, the series to be scheduled. So it's probably going to be coming after the holidays. Mm -hmm. um, so check back with Echo Colorado or better yet, there's probably a contact there that you could maybe email and say, hey, I want you to let me know when this series is, is back up and running. Terrific. So we, yeah, we'd love to have you. That'd be great. Great. And reminding everyone again that Nicole did put in the Echo Colorado link into the chat. So uh, make sure to click on that before we hang up today for those that are interested um, in learning more. All right. And then um, Wu Bandel from the Alzheimer's Association um, put in a great resource about um, dementia and the holidays, which I know um, can be difficult for some caregivers and families. And so um, a wonderful resource uh, from our terrific partner at the Alzheimer's Association here in Colorado. Um, they offer a number of caregiving resources as well as classes, trainings. So please um, click on that information there. Thank you, Wu, for including that uh, with today's presentation. Does anyone else have any other questions? And if so, just take yourself off mute and you can ask directly. All right. Well, it was a great presentation. Thank you, Dr. Cosmo. This was terrific. Gave us a lot to think about as well as a lot of resources um, that we can share with today's audience. So I really appreciate that. Um, to all Jody, of, yeah, Jody. Yep. Uh, Alyssa had her hand up and I don't think you saw it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead and take yourself off mute. Alyssa, did you have a question? Uh, okay. 
All right, thank you, Flo, for bringing that to my attention. I didn't see it, but it sounds like maybe she got her question answered. So, all right, everyone, um, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Be safe, stay well, um, and we will see you. Oh, no, I'm going to see you before Thanksgiving. I'll see you next Thursday. That's right. Uh, so next Thursday um, at 2 p.m., and then we'll say happy Thanksgiving to each other. So have a great rest of the week. And again, a big thank you to Dr. Corsmo. Appreciate you being here today. All right. Thank you, Jody. Thanks, Take everyone. Bye-bye.